on Kearns uh, interviewing Mr. Walter Billingsley at Wewoka, Oklahoma on November 18, 1971. Um, Mr. Billingsley has been a long time resident both of Oklahoma and of uh, Wewoka and I would like him to start off in his own words and give us his uh, background from his place of birth and on up until the time he got to Wewoka. Mr. Billingsley? Well, I was born in Fulton County, Arkansas, not far from the Missouri line. Lived there 11, the first 11 years of my life. Attended a one-room school <clears throat> about five months a year, two months in the summer, three months in the winter. In 1905, we moved to what, is, what was then the Indian Territory in the south part of what is now Hughes County was then a part of the Choctaw Nation. We lived there on a farm. About the only school that we had, the little town we lived near was called Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T, named after old Judge Stewart, who lived at McAllister and was a great lawyer. In 1908, right after statehood, I attended a teacher's institute at Jones Academy, an Indian boarding school for boys. Where was this located, Mr. Billingsley? About four miles north east of Hartshorn. And, uh, Pittsburgh County. I was fortunate enough at the end of the four weeks course to receive a certificate to teach school. This institute was held for six or seven counties in southeastern Oklahoma, extending all the way to McCurtain County, I think. I'm sure Atoka County was in it. That fall, I begun teaching school about two months after I was 18 years old. I was teaching at a little place called Cabinets. About 16 miles west of McAllister. It was a one-room school, a new schoolhouse, large, with two big stalls. And I had an average daily attendance of 81 and a fraction during that school year. I had 35 beginners. So these school teachers that quarrel about having more than 25 students should have lived at the beginning of statehood to see what teachers had to go through then. Mm -hmm. I continued to teach school in Pittsburgh County for four years and then came to We Woke and taught school north a few miles north of Weewoka, a community called Butner. There were two teachers there. I taught from the fifth grade to the eighth. I had a primary teacher that took care of the first four grades. In 1917, the county superintendent of public instruction whose name was Glines, G-L-I-N-E-S, resigned and the county commissioners appointed me as county superintendent. The 
law required then that uh, the county superintendent visit every school at least twice each year. There were more than 60 schools, so I'd have to visit three or four each day to have any time to spend in the office. But it was a rewarding experience. At the end of my term, I served four years as county superintendent. And at the end of my second term, I didn't want to go back to teaching the country school. So I decided I'd try to be a lawyer. With the help of three or four mighty fine lawyers who were my good friends, guiding me in the way to study and prepare for an examination. In June of 1921, I took the bar examination to Oklahoma City and was successful in being admitted to practice. I think that's outstanding for never having had any formal legal education. Well, I, actually, I went to school 37 months in my life. Well. The longest period of time I went to school was five months at one time. Well, that is remarkable. We didn't say we were in the third grade or fifth grade. We said we were in the third or fifth reader mm -hmm. when I went to school. I think when I begun teaching, they employed me more on account of my size than they did them what I knew. You could control them. After I started practicing law, I decided that I'd like to run for public office, so I ran for county attorney and was and served as county attorney of this county from 1923 to 1926. In the meantime, <clears throat> the oil boom had started in Seminole County. And when they got the first big well at Seminole, I resigned as county attorney and entered the private practice of law. I always liked the criminal practice, so I, I guess that the greater part of my experience as a country lawyer has been in the criminal practice. I've defended more than 300 homicide cases, more than most of them in this county some in other counties in this state and in surrounding states. I remember one time I'd been to Hot Springs, Arkansas to some political gathering there at which our Senator Elmer Thomas was the main speaker. On my way home, I came through Mena, Arkansas saw a big crowd around the courthouse. <clears throat> Decided I'd see what uh, was going on around that there was a murder trial beginning. They were searching everybody that entered the courthouse. The man charged had uh, killed one of the leading citizens of Mena. robbed him, took his car and his money. There was a great deal of feeling. There was fear that there might be mob violence. The state police were there in great number. A couple of young fellows were defending this man. But 
the situation was a little too much for them and they were having trouble even impaneling the jury. The judge, whom I'd never seen before, beckoned me up to the bench and informed me that he was appointing me to represent this man. I advised the court that I didn't have license to practice in the state of Arkansas. He said, you have now. I'm just admitting you to practice. So I spent the next two days defending him, pled temporary emotional insanity, and was able to hang the jury for seven hours, but they convicted him, which was right and proper. I've tried a good many sensational criminal cases. Some of them I remember the name of my client and some I've forgotten. I've tried to get several damage suits. Tried one damage suit in Arizona in which I secured a judgment for $207,000 and was paid a very high compliment by the federal judge who presided at the trial. When I was 70 years old, I decided I'd retire, but was unable to do so. The only way I could have would, be, would have been to close my office and stay away from it. And I couldn't do that. Finally, in 1969, our very fine judge, Bob Howe, prevailed upon me to accept the post of special district judge. I'm still doing the best I can to find out what is the best for these boys and girls that are brought in for various offenses. The special district judge has jurisdiction to try civil matters up to $400 without a jury, $2,500 with a jury. I try all preliminary hearings in this county and Hughes County and all the small claims in both this county and Hughes County take care of the misdemeanor docket. Keeps me busy most of the morning and in the afternoon I play dominoes usually. Yeah. Well now, um, do you in your uh, career, have you mentioned you had uh, uh, defended a number of criminal cases, the client in a number of criminal cases. Have you ever been in the position of prosecuting? Oh, yes. I've, I've prosecuted more than 50 murder cases. And uh, all types of crime, both as county attorney assistant county attorney and a special prosecutor. I've, uh, I've uh, been employed as special prosecutor in three different states and in several counties in Oklahoma other than Seminole County. Has it been your observation that uh, uh, justice is meted out in most instances or have you run across some cases in which you thought uh, the uh, decision was wrong? I, I haven't agreed with every decision. However, I, I think that the courts of Oklahoma have done a fine job. I, I realize that now, under the recent rulings of the Supreme Court, that it's almost impossible to, for the law enforcement agencies to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. They're 
handcuffed. That's right. Don't, don't you think that this uh, trend in the Supreme Court personnel may change this somewhat in the next four mm -hmm. five years? I certainly hope so. If, if the peace officers are not are not protected in their attempts to protect the people, then anarchy is the only thing they can follow. I agree entirely. There's one thing I was uh, curious about getting the opinion of uh, one of the legal profession. Have you any uh, feeling as to the necessity of a 12-man jury compared with what they're now proposing, six-man juries? I think in most cases a six-man jury would be as well as 12. However, our Constitution provides that in all criminal, all felony criminal cases, there must be a 12-man jury and it's a constitutional amendment in order to change that. However, by agreement, they could be tried and I'll try a case next Monday where both sides, a civil matter, where the lawyers on either side have agreed that it be tried before a six-man jury. They'd be entitled to 12, but they've agreed on six. I <clears throat> so I think that the trend is to use fewer, fewer jurors, jurors when it's at all possible. That would be a saving of money and a saving of time. Right. Sometimes in the impaneling of juries, maybe two or three days are taken up in just impaneling 12 men and women on the jury. Uh, does anyone, a uh, criminal case, stand out above all the others over the years to you? Oh, I guess so. I, I, there are three or four cases that I, I remember one case very distinctly where a man beat his wife up and drove her away from home in the middle of the night. She went to her father's home and the next day he started to come to we woke up with her in order for her to file suit for divorce before they had gotten a mile from her father's home her husband overtook them and uh, tried to drag her out of the wagon the woman's father picked up his shotgun out of the back of the wagon and killed his son-in-law. I defended him. He was shot in the back. The state contended that he used too much force. He was, the man that was killed, however, was still holding on to the arm of his wife and dragging her. Of course, we, I defended him on the theory that every man has a right to fight in his own necessary self-defense or in the self-defense of the one that's near and dear to it. In my argument to the jury, I told them that uh, my client's wife, who was not as young as she used to be, was sitting in a rocking chair facing the door. We were arguing this case at about 10 o'clock at night, finishing at about 10 o'clock. And I said, she's listening for her husband's footsteps to come up the wall. Mm -hmm. And she'll sit there and watch and listen until he gets there. And I hope you gentlemen will not keep her up all night. <laughs> the jury was out 10 minutes and came back with a verdict of not guilty. I tried a lot of cases that uh, I could talk about, but it would take a lot of time for me to do it. You go right ahead, tell us another one at least. We had a 
We had some fine lawyers in Seminole County in the early day. Bill Pryor, George Crump, who was a district judge here for a number of years. Guy Cutlip, who served on the Superior Court bench until the time of his death, about 1937. I've known every lawyer that's practiced law in Seminole County since statehood. They have, we don't have lawyers like, uh, like we had then. They don't try cases like they were tried then. They had fights in the courts in my early days. I tried cases with and against practically every lawyer that has practiced law in Seminole County since statehood. I've never had an enemy among the, the lawyers of this county or anywhere else. A lot of people talk about lawyers being crooks, but there are fewer lawyers in the penitentiary than, uh, than any other profession that I know of. <laughs> represent clients, are trusted with, without being under bond, with thousands and thousands of dollars. It's very seldom that you ever hear of a lawyer embezzling. Occasionally it happens, yes. but not often. So I've been pretty proud to be a member of the, this profession for now a little over 50 years. Well, I should think that uh, having been here this long, you'd know almost everyone in town, don't you? Well, I don't know as big. In 1924, I knew every man, woman, and child, and we woke up. And we had about as many people then as we have now. But uh, I know lots of people here. I know the old timers. The young people grow up and uh, I don't get acquainted with them. As you get older, they, they're not interested in old people. That's true. I try to think young, yeah. but being 81 years old, I can't think as fast as I used to. Do you think of anything else that might be of uh, interest in this uh, little dissertation? Did I call you Judge Billingsley? Some people do, and, and I don't be offended if they call me Walter. I meet, occasionally I meet some little Indian or Negro boy down on the street, and he said, hello, Walter. And that makes me feel good. I had 10 years experience in the Oklahoma legislature that was very rewarding to me, and I hope it didn't hurt the state any. What period was that during? I didn't hear. What period was that? I was elected, in, I, I served the 1941 session and through 1950, and I was Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1949-50. I'm not too good on Oklahoma history, but was that during the, any of the time when, that was after Bill Moon, right, wasn't it? After who? Bill Murray. Oh, yes. Bill Murray was governor in 1931 to 1935. Yeah. I served under Governor Phillips, Governor Kerr, Governor Turner. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I was speaker while Roy Turner was governor. Mm -hmm. And I think he was a fine governor. Yes. Governor Kerr was a wonderful governor, as well as a wonderful United States senator. Yes wonderful man. While I was speaker, we were able to have introduced and passed the Financial Responsibility Act, which I think was 
probably the highlight of uh, the accomplishment of that section of the legislature. My first session of the legislature, we, while Governor Phillips was the governor, we uh, enacted uh, laws that uh, kept the state from going bankrupt. Did you happen to know a man named Herbert Brannan in that oh, regard? Yes, I, uh, Herbert Brannan is one of the best friends I have. Herbert and I uh, were uh, vice presidents of Oklahoma Gas and Electric Company at the same time. We're both now retired, is the reason I ask you. And I knew that uh, Herbert was interested in the uh, uh, ba uh, Budget Balancing Act, I believe they called it. That's right. That's, that, was, that's, that was how we kept Oklahoma from going bankrupt. My father, balancing amendment. My father helped Herbert uh, in his first campaign for the legislature. I get a Christmas card from Herbert Brennan every Christmas. Mm -hmm. I'll give him your regard when I get home. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk into this instrument. Thank you very much, Judge. And if you think of nothing else, why we will say that this is Rollin Kearns terminating a very interesting interview with Judge Walter Billingsley, which I think I lived off in the title in the introduction of the thing, in November, on November 18, 1971, at Wewoka, Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you.